this webinar is called Smart Women Get the Good Guys. It was formerly called You Love Men Who Flake, Criticize, Lie, and Even Cheat. And I know what that's like. I uh, was in that situation myself a couple of times, which is why I created three strategies to break the cycle, take control of your own life, and invite real love, which is what I want for you. What you're going to learn in this uh, free class today. I'm going to give you strategy one, which is how to identify and respond to toxic behavior. There are a lot of red flags. So if you're single, you can look for these things when you start dating. But if you're with a partner and you're confused, you're going to be able to identify some of that behavior and you're going to learn and have tools in order to respond to that behavior in a positive way. Strategy two, I'm going to give you three dating tools and rules to avoid falling for toxic people. And the funny thing is these tools and rules, you can also apply to the relationship you're in now and even the relationships you have at work with friends and family. Strategy three is about changing you. So get ready. Um, we often, those of us that are attracted to narcissists and chaotics, tend to have three common self-defeating characteristics. Um, I'm gonna give you actionable tasks to begin to shed these characteristics. Um, that way you can choose love from your stronger self. Now a little about me. Um, some of you may have read some of my articles or have seen me on the internet and I'm very transparent about my past. I spent 10 years into each five-year relationships with two really toxic guys. I put up with inconsistency, criticism, no real commitment, and a lot of infidelity. Some of it I knew about, but some of it I didn't know about, yet I could sense it and smell it. I just tried to deny it, but it was there. So today I have 15 years experience in working 12-step recovery and helping people with 12-step recovery, also with goal setting, inner child work, and visualization. These are the foundation for recovery in my program. Um, I met and married my husband, um, who I call a honey man. He was a miracle. He was the blessing that I received after working so hard on my recovery. And it's funny, I used to resent working on recovery. I was like, don't I have better things to do? I mean, shouldn't I be one of those people that like hangs out on weekends and goes to the movies? Do I really have to go to all these 12 step meetings and work so hard? The fact is, it's the best thing I ever did for myself. It's the greatest gift I've ever given myself and I'd love to give it to you. So toward the end of class, I do have a special offer. I've been working on something for a year now, testing it with my private clients. It's my love school, but I'll get into that later. That's for people who really want to dig in and join me in group or one-on-one -on -one coaching. But let's get bit, let's get into the, the meat of this webinar right now. So strategy one is spotting the wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, there are four very common red flags um, that you're going to notice when you get involved with a new man that will tell you that he's a narcissist or an asshat or whatever you want to call it, and that you could should steer clear. It, these can also help you determine what's going on in your current relationship. And you might even notice these red flags in relationships with friends, bosses, coworkers. Um, so anyway, I'm going to be giving you some tasks at the end of this that will help you take care of yourself when you're in situations or relationships with these types of people. So. Red flag number one, he came on strong in the beginning, then cooled off fast once you were hooked. I'm going to just move this down here. Okay, so this is the guy that spots you across a crowded room and sweeps you off your feet into fiery inferno of passion, but as soon as you're in with him, he's running for the hills, okay? So a lot of times we, we think this guy is a player. And I think there might be a player phase in both women and men's lives, like in their early 20s where they're kind of playing the field. Maybe they're going through their Harry Styles moment. But after a certain age, it's not you're not a player anymore. You're actually really more of a sex and love addict, like maybe a Hugh Grant, like 55, time to figure that out. Anyway, for this guy, he treats women like a drug that he would inhale because that's what they are to him. And once he comes down and he feels the responsibility of a relationship, he starts to panic and he gets claustrophobic. And what's really confusing about a guy like this is that 
they genuinely want you to be the, the cure for their chaotic impulses. But the problem is no woman can cure them. If they're going to be cured, they have to do it for themselves. So when you're burning in the flames from his car driving away, you know, don't wonder why he did it, right? What's wrong with him? Put the focus on yourself instead, because that's where your power is. You know, start addressing the reasons that you're susceptible to or attracted to guys who try to snort you like a drug, because chances are you probably dated this guy a couple of times just in a different body. Oops, I think because I moved that, I can't click. There we go. Um, and if that's true, I know for me, uh, I dated a few different men with that characteristic. So it meant that he was not the problem. Not None of them were the problem. They were just a symptom of the problem. So I'm going to give you tasks for red flag number one, which I call Mr. Gone. <laughs> All right. So to address the reasons we're attracted to these types of people, we're going to start with a little bit of inner child work. I'm not going to go crazy with it, but by inner child, what I mean is from the time we were in, in, in the prepubescent pre era, so when, between being an infant to being about 11 years of age, we were incredibly impressionable at this time. We just soaked things in like we were little sponges. And although we may not consciously remember any dysfunction we experienced, it does live in our unconscious mind, which is responsible for making about 90% of our decisions in the present. So when we're traumatized as children, or even just mild dysfunction, we store deep and sometimes very, very painful emotions inside of us. And I call these emotions our origin emotions. And for many of us, these emotions are fear, shame, and grief. So I'm gonna tell you a story from my own childhood to explain how our origin feelings can actually help us stop to stop picking Mr. You know, gone. Okay, yeah, inner child work can help you stop falling for sex and love addicts or any kind of narcissist or user. So for me, my mom and dad divorced when I was two years old. Um, my mom's second marriage was very volatile and there were moments of domestic violence. So I was always worried for my mom. I was always felt like I had to be vigilant and that I, as a small child, had to keep her safe. So in my family uh, at that time, I played certain roles. There's my face in the way again. Um, so my childhood roles in that family were psychologist. I was like a little baby psychologist, with my little notepad. I was a soother. I was a people pleaser. But that's how I tried to control the chaos. So I came home from school one day, it was around 4.30, my mom wasn't home and she hadn't left a note, which was weird because she's a, she was a stay at home mom at the time. And I just had a bad feeling about it. And then the hours started going by and soon it was like six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, still not home, no word. I started, and my dad, stepfather wasn't home either, and I start canvassing the neighborhood on foot, going from house to house looking for my mom. And this hysteria began to build because I was just, positive that she was dead somewhere. Something terrible had happened. I finally found her in the last neighbor's home. Um, she was sitting around. They were all drinking and laughing and they might have been inebriated. I remember it that way and wine was, alcohol was definitely a part of my upbringing. So by that time I was hysterical and I think my mom was embarrassed. So she told me, Shannon, stop overreacting. I will be home in a minute. Just go home and I'll be there soon. So this is a memory I have about when my origin emotions became anchored in my unconscious mind. And I'm going to tell you what they were. Um, my origin feelings were fear that my mom would die if I wasn't ever watchful or that she might abandon me. And after the age of nine, she couldn't care for me. So I always saw her, but I didn't live with her. Grief that she seemed to care about my stepfather or partying more than me. And toxic shame, which was that I overreacted. And also that I just felt like I must be broken somehow and not lovable. And I had a lot of shame about that. So in my adult life, what would happen is, hang on a second, I want to make sure I haven't lost my place. Yeah. When I'd fall for a Mr. Gone, and um, he bailed on me, it would always trigger these origin emotions of fear, grief, and shame. But they were too painful for me to allow them to come up. 
So right away, I'd repress them and I would dive into what I call masking feelings. Okay, and I bet you're gonna recognize some of these. So masking feelings are feelings more along the lines of anger, anxiety, a need to control by analyzing the situation from every possible angle to figure out you know, what to do to control this person. And the reason we repress origin emotions and dive into masking emotions is because they give us a false sense of control. But the truth is, we have no control. You know, we could analyze, obsess till the cows come home. We still can't change another person's behavior or who they fundamentally are. So the truth is, it's only by feeling and releasing our origin feelings and emotions that we become emotionally sober. And emotionally sober women do not put up with guys who come on strong in the beginning and cool off fast once you're hooked. Because we can spot those love addicts from a mile away. So here are some tasks for becoming emotionally sober and kicking these guys to the curb or just avoiding them. <laughs> Use the sucky moment, right, to grow and heal. So when you get burned and ghosted by a love them and leave them guy, do this work right away. Number one, write down the emotions that came up. Are they masking emotions? Ask yourself that. Are they anger, anxiety, analyzing, and control, and obsession. Next, my face just keeps getting in the way. I wish there's a way to make it smaller. Maybe I can. Hang on a minute here. Um, all right, you'll just have to put up with it. Okay, so write down what emotions are beneath those emotions. Really take time and see, are you covering up a deep sadness or a fear of abandonment or embarrassment or shame or even more deeply felt grief. Then ask yourself, when and write about, when did you feel those emotions for the first time? What were you doing? Who were you in your family? How did those emotions come to be? This can be painful work, so you may wanna do this with a coach or a sponsor or a therapist who can guide you depending on how much uh, abuse there was in your childhood or dysfunction. Um, next, Find a safe place to go, a closet, a tennis court, you know, wherever, and let yourself feel those emotions. That could mean crying, it could mean beating a pillow, it could mean smashing a tennis ball against a wall a million times and thinking it's his head, <laughs> you know, but you just want to get all those emotions you're trying to repress out. Okay, the next thing you can do is journal about them and share them with a safe person because sharing our pain frequently, it frequently releases our pain. And the fact is we must grieve our childhood injuries to get sober. And when you're emotionally sober, you make healthier choices. I have to read this quote to you that I found by John Bradshaw, who's one of the pioneers in inner child work about getting rid of those or feeling those origin emotions and especially grief. So he says, Grief work is the legitimate suffering we've been avoiding with our neuroses. This involves obsessing about things, analyzing, discussing, and spending lots of energy on trying to think, figure things out. Like if I could take the weeks and months and years that I tried to figure my guy out and like put them to something useful, I would probably live in a yacht at the top of the world. I mean, it was a lot of time. By obsessing on things, one does not have to feel. So you're avoiding your feelings when you're obsessing. To feel anything is to tap into the immense reservoir of frozen feelings that are bound by your wounded child's toxic shame. It's deep stuff. To put it simply, our emotions are our most fundamental powers. We have them in order to guard our basic needs. So basic relationship needs, as described by CODA, the Codependence Book, are emotional security, material security, the sex relation, meaning that it's a safe place for you, and companionship, which means also a place you feel comfortable in in society. I think sometimes when we're in bad relationships, we have a lot of shame about it in terms of our uh, community and our social group. When one of our needs is being threatened, our emotional energy signals us. It's letting us know you have to heal or you have to feel to heal your inner child. So just think about some of that. It's um, pretty powerful stuff. Um, all right, so let's move on to red flag number two. He is unreliable and inconsistent. 
this hot and cold guy is incredibly confusing. And I have a great quote from a book that just saved my life. I was trying to break up with my last really hot and cold toxic guy. And I was, I was making all these excuses for him and why he was behaving the way he was. And it was probably my fault. And if I was just blah, 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 blah you know, five years of this. So I ended up in a self-help section of a bookstore. I wish there were more bookstores now because you can't really find them. But this is book called uh, Men Who Can't Love. And I read this and that was it. I was like, what? All right. The commitment phobic man is a man of two minds, each with a distinct point of view, a distinct and separate point of view. One wants to be in a good relationship with a woman who loves him. We like that guy. The other views a permanent relationship as a suffocating trap. That guy's going to break our hearts. He cannot give a clear yes and he can't say no. For every step forward, he takes two back. So you may know this guy. This is the guy that gets you in the uh, makeup and breakup cycles. We're together, we're not together. We're, you know, you're always having to forgive him because he comes back crying and begging and pleading and he's sincere and you know he's sincere and you rescue him and then it all starts all over again because as soon as you're there for him, it's like, oh my God, you know, he freaks out and starts running again. So I don't know. I don't know if that guy's familiar to you, but I dated that guy. So actionable tasks for red flag number two, Mr. Hot and Cold. In the past, my dance of death with this kind of guy was to do everything in my power to make him be consistent. God damn it, right? I tried pleading and threatening, crying, doing backflips in bed. It was exhausting. And I call these my manipulations. And in recovery, I realized that they were wreaking havoc in my life. So I'm going to give you three tasks for the red flag of Mr. Hot and Cold. Okay, let's see. Do I click? Oh, no. Here we go. Number one, don't look at his behavior. Don't do it. You already have seen his behavior and you can't figure it out. So look at your own behavior. Number two, list all the manipulations you've tried to make your man consistent, reliable, and committed. Number three, write down how your manipulations have made your life unmanageable. So I'm going to give you some examples. Manipulation. You ask for less and less in the relationship while giving more and more in the hopes he'll be more consistent and there for you. Believe it or not, this is a manipulation. It's the manipulation of people pleasing. Because you think if you just give and give and give and give, it's going to change, but it never does. All right. The unmanageability. Massive resentment. Okay. I don't care how much of a martyr you are. I don't care how sweet and kind and giving you are. You're going to be resentful if you're giving and giving and getting nothing in return. And eventually you're going to lose it. You're going to explode. And boy, that's what he loves because then he feels entitled to treat you even worse and give you even less because he says you're the crazy person. And the fact is you look like you are the crazy person. You're not, but he's driven you crazy. So <laughs> I'm going to give you a really, really amazing tool if you're in this kind of a scenario to use, and it's gonna change your life. It's called contrary action. It changed my life, and it was like the best thing that ever happened to me. So, contrary action is just what it sounds like. Remember George Costanza from Seinfeld? You know, he was like, hey, whatever I would normally do, I'll just do the opposite, and he was very successful. That's exactly what it is, okay? In my case, I would, oh, did I talk about my thing? Oh, I don't think I did talk about my thing. I think I jumped right through my thing. Oh, I know what I was going to tell you. Okay. I was going to use a personal story from my own life, which I didn't, which I didn't do, but I'm going to do it now. Okay. So this is what happened. I wanted my boyfriend to go to a wedding with me. I was a maid of honor in this wedding. It was a big deal. And he didn't want to go. He hemmed, he hawed. I did everything to try and get him to go. I was people pleasing. I was threatening. I was begging, pleading. Finally, I twisted his arm enough that he said yes. Well, moments before we were about to leave, he informs me he's too tired to go because he just got back from a boy's trip to Las Vegas. Oh my gosh. I mean, you can imagine, talk about explosion. It was four letter words. I stormed out. I was just steaming with anger and I'm in my car and I'm like, you know, this guy's making me crazy. And I had been in recovery long enough that the word contrary action popped into my head. Well, contrary action is like, why do I have to take contrary action? He's the one who's being a jerk. But I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
what side of the sidewalk is mine to keep clean? Okay, let me see here. Oh, there, I'm on the right page now. Um, and I had to get into humility. I had to really get humble and think about it. And then I had an epiphany. And I walked in, oops, ahead of myself again. I walked in and I sat down next to him and I said, you know what? I had an agenda inviting you to this wedding. I really want to get married. And I know you don't want to get married. But I was hoping that if I took you to the wedding and you had a good time, you would see that marriage is a good thing. And then maybe you'd want to marry me. And I, that was my hidden agenda. It was even hidden from me. I didn't even know that was my agenda, but it was. So I apologized to him for my hidden agenda, brushed myself off, and went to the wedding. And it was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. I was free. And then when I got to the reception, he was there waiting for me. And the funny thing is, you know, he didn't change, but I changed. And it was the beginning of me taking back my life. I'm just missing something here. Oh, well. Yeah, it was. It was, it was the beginning of me taking back my life. And contrary action can break us out of our habitual reactive behavior stemming from self-destructive traits that we're going to get to in strategy three. Okay, let's move on to red flag number three. He constantly criticizes you. Yes, that is me, 30 years ago, looking great. Um, I don't look like that anymore, so you don't have to feel bad. <laughs> I was dating a man at that time. He was my first boyfriend, my first serious love, um, and my first toxic relationship. And he told me frequently that my body was not attractive. And specifically, he told me that I had cellulite on my legs, which I couldn't see. And sometimes even during sex, he would point it out to me. He'd pinch my thigh to show me these little dimples. Um, why do toxic men do this? Why do they use criticism in this way? And what I realized as the years went by was the more he criticized me, the less I believed that I deserved to have any needs in the relationship at all. And, the, and also the less I believe that anyone else would love me with all these flaws, that I was lucky to be with this guy considering, you know, how unattractive I was. So if you're in a situation with a partner who's constantly criticizing you and damaging your self-esteem, I want to give you a task. I want you to contact at least five friends, maybe 10. And these are people who love you, support you, don't judge you. And I want you to ask them to write three positive adjectives that describe you and send them to you. I think you're going to be overwhelmed by what happens. I did this and it actually moved me to tears. I was so surprised. They saw things in me that I couldn't see in myself. Then I want you to write them down, print them out, and use them as an affirmation every single day as much as you need to, to start to get your self-esteem to grow. Because when our self-esteem grows, we can move past people that abuse us in this way. Okay, the last biggie, red flag number four. He makes you feel crazy for not trusting him, even though he acts shady. All right, so this is the guy that tells you you're an insecure, clingy, neurotic person for suspecting him of cheating, even though he will not let you anywhere near his phone, his computer. It's like they're the lost Ark of the Covenant. You don't touch them do not open them. Okay. And he takes all of his calls out of earshot. So when your guy is acting shady and he gaslights you by accusing you of being neurotic and insecure, you can work a concept that I call the three A's. And the three A's are awareness, acceptance, and action. So I'm going to give you some examples. Awareness. You don't trust him because you think he might be cheating. Acceptance, you don't deny feeling unsafe. You, you accept it as your truth. Because when you have this awareness and you bring it up, they're going to deny, deny, deny. You've got to listen to your instincts and your gut. And you've got to accept the fact that you don't feel safe. You may not be ready to take any action about it, but you have to get into acceptance. Next, when you're ready to take action. Now, you may think the action should be a big action, like breaking up with him and never seeing him again. But the fact is, you're working recovery. You know, you, you might just choose another one like him. So don't put pressure on yourself to get into, let's stop this relationship immediately. 
Instead, learn to detach and to protect yourself setting a healthy boundary. Now, one boundary might be that if you don't trust him, that you might not sleep with him. You, you might say, I'm not going to sleep with you while I don't feel safe. Okay, that's almost impossible for those of us that are codependent or addicted to our guy. So I'm going to teach you a little more about the tool of detachment because that can help you set boundaries. Yeah, detachment helps you get clarity and it helps you take care of you first. One thing you should know, you don't have to do detachment perfectly. It's a, it's a really, really it's a spiritual practice and it takes time. Detachment's really achieved once and for all. It's a moment by moment, day by day process of accepting reality as it presents itself, doing our best to align our actions with what we think is right and surrendering the outcome. Tough stuff to do, but so powerful. Num so these are the steps. Let's just give you some steps and then I'm going to explain to you, maybe give you some examples of how to work them. Number one, no, it's not your fault if your guy is acting shady or maybe unfaithful. It is not your fault. It's a pattern of behavior and they want you to feel it's your fault. It's not. Two, feel your origin emotions. I'll get into how. Three, get into the audience of your own life. That means stop looking at him and look back at yourself. Again, I'll give you an example. Four, what can you learn from the situation? What can you learn from the circumstances? Five, replace your, act your reactions to your toxic guy with actions that will strengthen and empower you. That's what we're headed toward. So how to detach from a man who might be or is cheating on you. All right, I'm gonna break them down for you with a story of my own. I have so many, lucky me. I'd been apartment hunting with my inconsistent shady boyfriend, which, because I thought, well, that's the next step. That's the step before marriage. It must have scared the crap out of him, though, because that night I found him in bed with another woman. It was not, I don't recommend it. So I, I left in a very dramatic way and I vowed never to return, but I knew I was lying to myself because I was addicted to him as if he were my own personal heroine. Okay. I didn't know about detachment at that time. So I'm going to tell you what I actually did versus what I could have done had I been aware of detachment and had that tool. Okay. No, it wasn't my fault. I did not realize it wasn't my fault. You know, I thought for sure it was because I wasn't always nagging him to get married or do this or do that. And the fact is, <clears throat> if a man is repetitively unfaithful or giving you the feeling that they're not true, that's about him. It's part of who he is as a person. Two, feel my origin feelings. So what I did was I went right into masking feelings I or emotions. I obsessed. I analyzed. I tried to figure out what I could do to change him into a devoted guy. Like I hadn't thought about that a million times. What I would have done if I'd been able to use the tool of a detachment is I would have journaled about what origin emotions this betrayal triggered. For me, definitely fear of abandonment and shame that I was unlovable. Then I would have set analyzing and obsessing aside. I could always come back to it, right? They're always going to be there waiting for you. <laughs> okay. Believe me, they will always be there waiting for you if you need them or want them. But instead I should have, I could have allowed myself to get the feelings of grief and shame out of my body by feeling them whatever that meant, whether that meant sobbing, whether that meant screaming, whether that meant running six miles, just getting them out and then getting them onto paper where they could do some good and no harm. Okay. Because the more we know about ourselves, the healthier we become. Okay. Next, get into the audience of my life. What I did was I focused on him. I told everybody how horrible he was and all the terrible things he did because I wanted everyone to know so that maybe I wouldn't go back to him. Like I knew that if I told all these people and I went back to him that I'd be so ashamed. So I put myself in this horrible position of telling everybody. And then I had to lie to them when I went back because of course I went back. I was in my disease, you know, my disease of addiction to him. So what I would have done if I worked detachment is I would have focused on myself, not on him. I would have looked into my own behavior instead of his to get clarity about how I was running my life. And being in the audience of my life, I would have seen that I spent most of my time stalking him to make sure he wasn't cheating or plying him with sex to keep him faithful. Um, 
<laughs> you know, sometimes we call that time recording in a different meeting, but it is becoming aware of what your life looks like from the outside and taking a little distance from it. It, it, it helps it to be less painful and you can look at it like an investigative reporter. Finally, what could I learn from this? So after I've looked at my life, I could have learned that I needed to commit to discovering which self-defeating character traits were keeping me stuck with guys like this. And those traits for me would have been love addiction and codependency disorder. And there are treatments for those. Um, so I could have taken action. So we're going to get into replace reactions with actions. What I did was I was in a near constant state of reaction. I made threats I couldn't carry out. I abandoned myself by going back to him before he proved that he could be trustworthy. What I would have done um, if I were working detachment was to take these empowering steps. Um, I would have gone to maybe 30 meetings in 30 days of Codependence Anonymous, like really saturated myself in recovery because that can shock the system out of addiction. I would have done kind things that showed me I love myself by cooking and eating good food or dancing or exercising or doing whatever it took to get the feelings up and out. And finally, I would have forgiven myself because I was doing the best I could with what I knew at the time. And self-forgiveness is a huge part of recovery. So I want you to tattoo this on your forehead. When we react, someone else is controlling us. When we detach and take positive action, we are in control of our own lives. And guess what? I wrote that. You can quote me on that one. Um, it's a good one. All right. So let's get into strategy two, dating rules and tools. Oh, no. Strategy, yeah, two. Um, okay. So the first thing you need is a game plan because that gives you confidence when you get out there dating. Uh, number one, do not lie to yourself when you go out dating, okay? Or even when you're in a relationship, don't lie to yourself. Know who you are and what you want before you start dating someone new, okay? Don't pretend to be casual and easygoing and, and need-free if you're not. Now, if you're on a first date, you don't have to like bang the guy over the head with your wants and needs, right? But just have them in mind. Um, and it's good to have a list of what you're looking for in a partner before you date. Now, I'm not talking about the blue eyes, this job, abs of steel list. I'm talking about a values list. What values do you want in a partner to share with you? Okay. Then if you notice any red flags on the first few dates, that will indicate you need to slow down and keep your wits about you before you just dive right in and devour him. If you're already attached to a toxic guy, writing down and visualizing the kind of relationship you want can be a powerful tool for helping you detach from him and from an emotional cycle of abuse. Um, in my love school, we use a creating your perfect mate. Um, it's a linchpin for recovery. I'll get into that a little bit later. So dating rule number two, do not allow your sex organs to pick a relationship. This is why we have arranged marriages in many cultures, because vaginas sometimes cannot be trusted, okay? A lot of times we are attracted to people that mirror our family of origin. So if you've got a great family of origin, you're probably attracted to really great guys. And if you had a challenging family of origin, I mean, my vagina would like walk into the nearest bar and pick out the guy that just got out of Rikers. That's, that was her taste. So of course, I realized I couldn't trust her. She was not interested in my wonderful, kind, sweet husband when we started dating. Um, the funny thing is that as our marriage progressed, our sex life became better and better because I could relax and enjoy him. I trusted him and I knew he was just with me. Where the hot, smoking hot guys, you know, the firefighters and whoever else, the sex got worse and worse because most of the time I was using it to audition for wife. And that is some pretty stressed out sex. So anyway, yeah, I've said enough on this one. Let's move on to dating rule number three. We touched on the family of origin. You want to avoid the familiar if you come from a home with toxic dysfunction. So I did take care of dysfunctional adults as a child, and this really uh, drew me to dysfunctional men that I felt I needed to take care of. I subverted a lot of my needs as a child to fill the needs of the adults. And so I selected relationships where I gave and gave and felt guilty or nervous to have any needs of my own. And then I would turn into a demanding doormat because I would finally just get so angry. So take a good hard look at your family of origin and just discover if you're selecting dysfunction because they were dysfunctional. Um, knowledge in this circumstance is power. 
Now we're moving on to strategy three, which is changing you. And you might ask, why do I have to change when he is the one who's the asshat? And that is not a bad question. But the reality is, it's only through self-awareness that we can change ourselves and then change our lives. We can't change anyone else as much as we try. Okay, so I'm gonna move into the three common self-defeating character traits that can keep you stuck in these types of toxic relationships. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> Trait number one, I mentioned it briefly in dating, which is generational dysfunction. So it's not like our parents were dysfunctional. They just, you know, they had this great upbringing and then they just turned into these jerks that did everything wrong, you know, that we can blame, blame, blame them. The fact is that most likely this stuff is handed down generation to generation. So for instance, my dad's dad was a gambler. So there was a lot of financial stress in the family. And his mom was a very bitter, angry woman, not very demonstrative and quite critical, um, probably because of the financial stress in the home. Um, so this impacted my dad's ability to feel safe and to feel loved. My mom's mom married three times. Um, and the first time was to my mom's grand my, my grandfather. So this created a lot of instability for my mom, a lot of chaos. And her father was funny and charismatic, but he was also extremely angry. Um, he kind of had, a, I think, an anger addiction to anger and was very volatile. And this impacted the ability for my mom to feel safe and loved. And then on top of that, you know, my stepdad lied to, criticized, and cheated on her. So I witnessed that from the very impressionable ages of four to nine. So by the time I came of dating age, I'd absorbed inconsistency, emotional withdrawal, criticism, and infidelity on a cellular level. So I was sort of just continuing the cycle of dysfunction um, that my parents had also suffered from. So for you to figure out the level of dysfunction you may have come from, um, and we all have a little bit of it. I mean, no parents are perfect. I'm gonna ask you these questions and just answer yes or no. Do you feel guilty for standing up for yourself? Do you feel overly responsible for your toxic guy's behavior? Do you rescue him, sometimes from his own bad behavior? Are you afraid if you don't perform for your man that he'll leave you? That's a tough one. Do you constantly judge, your, judge yourself and feel you're falling short in love and life? Oh, that one is so painful. If you related to any of these questions, you most likely do have some generational dysfunction where some or many of your childhood needs were not met. This can turn you into a human doing rather than a human being who deserves to be loved just for being themselves. So I'm going to give you a few tasks to help you heal the trait of generational dysfunction. Okay. And these actionable tasks are going to help you eliminate childhood coping mechanisms. Okay. When we come from dysfunction, we, well, here, I'll just write this down. Yeah. So number one, list the coping mechanisms you developed as a child to survive in your home. For me, they were people pleasing, I had no boundaries, and I rescued. Write down how these childhood coping mechanisms have been destructive in your adult life. For me, my people pleasing made me resentful when men used me. My lack of boundaries meant I constantly abandoned myself and my needs in my toxic relationships and I frequently slept with men too soon and then would be with them for five years. That was not a good, good way to, for me to go to take care of myself. My rescuing meant I even rescued my toxic guys from their hurtful behavior by taking responsibility for it. Um, you know, and leaving them permanently, it's strange. It made me worry like they might not be okay without me. And I mean, that definitely, I think, comes from my fears that I had about my mom. So number three, write down what you think a person who loved herself would do. Would do. That really pissed me off the first time someone told me to do that. I'm like, what? I love myself. But when I really thought about it, you know, for me, a person who loved herself would take responsibility for her choices and stop blaming the other person and do any and all work necessary to recover. For me, that meant taking my pitiful little waitress salary and getting a therapist. I remember thinking, I could go out to dinner with this 50 bucks. It was like, no, this money is for me, for me to heal and recover. And it was the best thing I ever did. All right, finally, write down what contrary actions you could take to deal with your childhood coping mechanisms 
in this relationship. So contrary action for me meant stopping whenever possible all of my coping mechanism behavior. So this meant no people pleasing to get what I wanted. I had to ask directly for what I wanted in my relationship and let go of the results. It also meant no more stalking him to see if he was cheating because that was breaking the boundaries of my self-esteem. I was crossing over my own healthy boundaries. I had to stop doing that. Um, it also meant no rescuing him when he tearfully wanted back in. It's hard, you know, when you feel like you have to take care of people, it's painful to let them take care of themselves. Um, but I had to stop rescuing. Okay. Trait number two is sex and love addiction. Okay. Here are just four symptoms of sex and love addiction. There are others, but I think these are the ones that really typify the addiction. Number one, attracting troubled, addicted, abusive, or emotionally unavailable partners. Two, mistaking sex and romance for intimate love. Hello, that was me. Three, using sex and or love to mask loneliness or unhappiness. And for, in my case, it was also to mask boredom. I'd get bored and I'd just, how was I going to fix the boredom? I had to go find someone to be addicted to. Four, constantly falling in love with strangers and looking for the one. There's more than one. There's so many wonderful people out there. Um, so I had every one of these symptoms and I don't, I actually don't have them anymore because of my recovery. And I want to say one more thing though about the sex part of sex and love addiction. Um, it really doesn't have to do with the quantity of sex you're having as much as it has to do about the quality of the sex you're having. If you're having sex to try and get someone to love you or to get out of boredom or to get out of fear or to get out of any of those things, that is a sex and love addiction. So if you recognize yourself in these symptoms, there are specific tasks I can give you right now. It's a deep program to work, but first pick up the Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous book. It is mind blowing. Also, and take notes and do the exercises. Um, there's no title on the cover, so nobody knows what you're reading. So you can be private and anonymous. Next, attend at least six Sex and Love Addict Anonymous meetings. You don't have to be there in person. You can do a phone meeting if, if that's better. I think in person is great because when you're amongst other people suffering from the same ailment, you can get a lot of recovery there. And the last thing you can do is journal about your sexual encounters and try to determine what the quality of those encounters are. Are you in the disease of love addiction? So before we get to the last self-defeating character trait that's keeping you stuck in toxic relationships um, and their remedies, I wanna talk to you briefly about my love school. Um, I have spent the last year building this. It is a labor of love um, and I've been fortunate to have about 10 clients work through it with me so that I could hone it and so that it would be the most impactful. And what we found is 10 weeks is a really good period of time because you hit it hard and get it done and it can be a catalyst for a great deal of change in your life. All right, so I'm gonna be a little cheesy and I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes because I could not have imagined these things when I was in my toxic relationships. I didn't realize that they existed. So close your eyes. Are you closed? Are they closed? Okay, I'm not gonna close mine. Number one, what would it feel like to shed all the character traits that keep you stuck in toxic, toxic relationships? What would it feel like to know you have a man you can trust who is loving and supportive and kind and always has your back? What would it feel like to be proud of yourself and proud of your relationship? What would it feel like to be cherished? You know, that one, I, when I wrote down, it actually made me kind of emotional because if you'd have told me that it was possible to be cherished about 20 years ago when I was in the middle of all of it, I would have said that that was Pollyanna thinking, but I'm experiencing that in my life and I'm hoping my husband feels as cherished as I do. Okay. When you take this or when you work this um, program, you'll be exposed to the groundbreaking work of Melody Beatty which has everything to do with the codependency. John Bradshaw, which is about reclaiming and championing your inner child. You'll be exposed to the work I've done in Codependence Anonymous, Al-Anon, and Sex and Love Addict Anonymous. 
Also, you will leave love school with a mental health village in place that will sustain you long after our work is done. They say that it takes a village to raise a child. I believe it also takes a village to raise our emotional and our mental health. You're going to clear up beliefs that no longer serve you. Like, if I just try harder, he'll change. That is an exhausting belief, right? I'm not attracted to good guys. We use that one frequently because we want to justify where we are in our lives. There's no one out there for me. Oh, sometimes I can really feel that way. And I, I really get it. I do. I believed it. And, um, and thank God I got over that. And I'm too broken to love. Oh, you know, I just felt like I had to be perfect to be loved. I had to say the right things and do the right things at the right time to be loved. And what's so funny is when I started dating my husband, I said all the wrong things. I did all the wrong things. I told him I loved him first. I told him I was neurotic. I told, you know, I told him everything. I told him I wanted to get married. That cat was out of the bag, you know, pretty quick. Guess what? He didn't scare him off. So you don't have to be perfect. I'm here to tell you right now. All right. So here's a brief curriculum overview. In week one, we're going to set bold love goals and bold visualizations. Um, this is where we're going to use my Create Your Perfect Mate module. It's really effective. Week two, finding your love lighthouses. This is all about role models. I think role models are so important when it comes to uh, changing our lives because when we have them, there's like there's a beacon, you know, there's a light that shines the way. Week three, changing your mode of operation. So this is you, me, you and me, working with your manipulations and the unmanageability that they're creating in your life. Week four is about building your mental health village um, because we need lots of support to shock our system into recovery. Um, week five is our cleaning house week. And that, that one usually takes a couple weeks um, because this is when we dig up those self-defeating character traits brush them off and try to send them to someone else, send them out, send them away. Week six is about releasing toxic shame because we're only as sick as our secrets. So we're going to share with each other um, and with others our challenges. Week seven, transformation and letting go. This is higher power work. I want agnostics and atheists to know this can still work for you. I was agnostic when I started doing higher power work, but it was life altering for me. Week eight, taking responsibility for your part. That is, what part do you need to forgive yourself for? How did you injure yourself? And how did you injure others? If you were with a guy that was inconsistent, maybe you were inconsistent in your friendships or with your family because you were so obsessed with this guy. So week eight is when you get to take responsibility for those things. Week nine is a new way of life. This is about self-forgiveness and continuing self-evaluation daily. And week 10 is about giving back to keep real love. Now, those of us that give and give in relationships, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being of service in a healthy way. Um, because when we're of service, we feel worthy. We feel purposeful. And sometimes when we're in an addiction, our only sense of purpose is trying to control that person. So we're not really able to be of service to our family and our community. So working these modules and sessions are going to help you fall in love with you, which is our only, well, it's our first goal. Love school, you get to fall in love with yourself first. And then after that, you get to fall in love with someone else. Okay. You'll be able to set healthy boundaries with all toxic people in your life. You'll become a magnet for loving, healthy people. You'll understand what your family taught you about love that's sabotaging you, and you'll be able to write a new script to help you manifest a healthy, interdependent relationship, which is a perfectly good thing to want. There's nothing wrong with wanting that. So I do have two packages in love school because I want to meet every um, budget. So the basic package is the catalyst package, and in that package, you're going to be delivered one at one a week, um, 10 self-discovery modules over the course of 10 weeks. You're going to do the homework, and then you're going to attend five 75-minute group coaching teleconferences, and they're going to be in the morning and the evening. They're anonymous because you're going to be on the phone. No one can see your face or know your name. 
Um, and in fact, if you want to go to both the evening and, and the morning one, you'll get 10 group coaching teleconferences. Um, you'll also have lifetime membership in my Recovery Road Warrior Facebook group. And then the transformation package, that's the premium package. Um, and it's the one-on-one -on -one coaching. So first we'll do a 60 minute intake call where I find out where you are today and where you wanna go. Next, you'll also receive the same self-discovery modules that will be delivered over 10 weeks. And because I'll know more about you, I can tailor those a little bit, sort of help you with the wording of it. Um, then you're gonna have 10 one-on-one -on -one private coaching calls for 60 minutes after each module, a mod, uh, week four, sometimes I'll stretch it to an hour and a half because that's a pretty intensive week. Um, you're gonna get lifetime membership also in my private Facebook <laughs> Road Warrior group. I can't, it's, those words are hard to say together. Special bonuses. So for those of you who are on the call live today, I do have your email addresses. I don't mean to be so stalkery, but I will send you a free um, download of my book on Kindle, but, um, both Catalyst and Transformation clients can receive a copy of my book in paperback, which is great because then you can take notes and draw little mustaches and things like that. Plus, you'll receive my How to Vanquish Resent Painful Resentment and Live a Freer, Happier Life. That one, I came, came by that one, honestly. Worked my, took us off on that one. You have a transformation package bonus, which is um, you can also join the Catalyst teleconferences. but you can't share. You, you just have to listen. But sometimes listening to other people's recovery can be just as powerful as being coached yourself. All right. One more transformation package bonus. So if you decide you'd like to continue working with me beyond the 10 self-discovery modules, you'll be locked into the special discount that I'm offering today because you're on my live webinar. A lot of you guys are going to want to dive in. You're going to want to do the 10 weeks, boom, boom, boom. Others of you are going to need more time to marinate, to think, to journal, and to work through the program. And I want you to know that I am flexible and, um, and that I want to, to move at the same pace you want me to work at. The only thing that I can't really change are the tele, teleconferences. I always thought those were like TV conferences, but now I know they're telephone conferences um, because those need to be on a schedule. I would highly recommend you always show up to those because even if you're not quite up to that module, you're still going to get a ton of benefit um, from listening to other people being co coached. So I want to get into the last codependent personality trait. I'm just going to put these away a little bit over here which is code, it's the big one. It's codependent personality disorder. And that one's a tough one, um, but it is workable. It is. Um, so Melody Beatty is one of my favorite people who writes about codependent um, personality disorder. And this is how she describes a codependent. A codependent is one who has let another person's behavior affect him or her, and who is obsessed with controlling that person's behavior. Codependence is a disease that deteriorates our souls. That's, okay, let's see. And then this is how I describe it. Codependence is trying to control another person to avoid pain and abandonment and to force security and love. I can't tell you how many times I tried to force someone to love me. Nobody wants to be in that position. You don't want to force anybody to love you. And you don't have to. You deserve to be loved, and, and you will, you'll come to believe that. So the following task is to teach you the difference between reacting and acting during a codependent crisis. Okay, so we're going to talk about trait number three. Task number one, you do want to act and not react. Reacting is what we do when we're in our codependency disease. We're not thinking rationally. We are reacting to our origin wounds. So here's an example of the difference between reacting and acting. Reacting, he canceled plans at the last minute again. You yell, beg, seduce, and guilt trip to get him to change his mind. How this is self-destructive is it's a loss of self-esteem and it's a growth of self-hatred. So when we resort to reacting to our guy's emotionally abusive behavior, it does, it kills our self-esteem. We might feel the same kind of shame 
a recovering alcoholic feels when they take another drink, when we act out on our codependency. So what would acting look like in this scenario? Acting would be, say what's true. You're disappointed. You were looking forward to seeing him. His inconsistency and unreliability unre hurt you. Then get off the phone and let go of the results, okay? By taking the detachment steps that I had, that we discussed earlier. And the second task is to forgive yourself because codependency is a disease. Um, and it is, it's a disease. And so if you can think of it, would you be mad at yourself? Would you hate yourself and be angry with yourself if you had the flu or any other kind of virus or, or bacteria? Um, so you have to think of your codependency as something you caught in childhood and that you're going to be healing in the present day. Okay, and I have one last task for codependency disorder, and that is what I call the three C's. So <clears throat> here's, here's one of, a couple of sub traits under the codependency title. Many of us with codependency disorder have a misplaced sense of responsibility and an overabundance of empathy. This is especially true if we had to parent a parent in childhood. For example, so I'm going to give you an example. My ex would behave badly and my misplaced responsibility would kick in. I'd think maybe it was my fault he didn't come home all night because I've been pressuring him to propose. Instead of thinking, he's treating me badly because he can't commit and he's acting out. If I did manage to gather my self-esteem around me and leave, Often he'd come back crying and saying he'd changed. In fact, he'd already changed and wouldn't I take him back? That's when my overabundance of empathy would kick in because if I didn't take him back, I worried that he might self-harm and I know where that comes from now, right? So when you feel these little sub-traits of codependency disorder kicking in, that's the time to practice a motto I call the three C's, which is you didn't cause his dysfunction, you can't control it, and you can't cure it. Those are really big ones, guys, because we're spending a lot of time blaming ourselves for the dysfunction, trying to control it, and trying to cure it. And we can do none of those things. We did not cause it. We can't control it. We can't cure it. So when we stop taking responsibility for other people's bad behavior and character defects, we can start healing our own. Okay? All right. We're good. There, there are... Um, there are more traits, more self-defeating traits that we get into in the heal, you know, into healing the catalyst and transformation programs. There's the martyr complex, the God complex, the stubbornness and pride complex, low self-esteem, behaving crazier than your guy because they make us crazy, and stuck in makeup breakup cycles. So, you know, here's one thing I want to say: as you continue your work of self-discovery and healing, please remember not to do this with self-criticism, okay? You're already getting criticized enough as it is. Please do this with self-compassion, with patience. It's gonna take time and you deserve the time. All right, I have one last affirmation for you guys that I'd love you to keep. I don't know if you can screenshot it or something and maybe use it every morning looking into the mirror. I think affirmations are really powerful. Say them out loud. Don't just think them. And look yourself in the eye if you can in a mirror. Good morning, brave girl. I am so proud of how hard you're working to heal the wounds that invite difficult relationships into your life. Be very patient with yourself throughout this process because you are lovable and priceless exactly as you are right now. And that's the truth. So anyway, I, I really look forward to helping um, again, take a pop on over to these links. And you know, if you're not ready to, to enroll, definitely set up a breakthrough session with me. I'd love to get to know you and I'd love to help you. You're not, if you have the, uh, the breakout session with me, breakthrough session, um, you're not obligated to enroll in the program. And I will definitely give you some actionable tools that you can take away from that phone call. So I think that's it. Um, not really sure how to end this, but thank you so much for being here.